All right, what's up, everyone? I'm here with uh, your favorite softball coach uh, and one of the best in the country. And, and if you don't mind me saying, Lonnie, one of the, one of the best that's ever done it. Um, when you look at what your tenure and what your career has been at Florida State, I wanted to start philosophically with you on that subject. Yeah. Uh, what were what were you not good at when you first became a head coach? What <laughs> wow. did you have to? I'm sure that you would probably list a few things, but what were one or two things that you really had to learn? and grow as you, as you kind of grew into that role? Who? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Always a joy. Um, you're incredible at what you do and such uh, passion and you. I love it. So thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize how much behind the scenes stuff, um, you know, goes on as a, a head coach of a program, essentially, like you're the CEO of softball, you know? And so um, I had to get a lot better at just managing people and managing the game, fundraising, um, you know, future planning for the facilities, um, just growing the game itself and just uh, contract negotiations, like just so many things that are just not the X's and O of the softball field. And um, so I really had to challenge myself in that part of it and then continually challenge our staff at um, growth development. You know, I'm so lucky to have a staff that's been together too, and I've been together for a long time. And so you can really get into your program and you start to only know what you know, and you really have to challenge yourself outside that. So I've been very lucky to, for, for professional development, really challenging myself. And, you know, we all have egos if we're any if we're even close to good. At, if we think we're good at what we do. Um, and as you just said, I might be the best that's ever done it. You might be the best that's ever done it. We got a lot in common, Lonnie. So but we, we do all have egos. But was there ever a moment when you were at Florida State and you look, you've always they, you've always had good teams here, but they weren't always great. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, back when you first started that you wondered, OK, am I elite like personally looking within yourself, do I have an elite program? Am I an elite coach? What do I have to do to get there? Or did you always have kind of an, kind of an unwavering self-belief? Yeah, um, I think there's always been an unwavering self-belief. It uh, doesn't matter what state, uh, what weather, what environment we're in. I felt like we could win. You know, I felt like we... Um, we do it a little bit differently in the sense that, um, you know, we love teaching and we love growing the game um, for the individual and for the team. And obviously for our conference, you know, wanting to get after it. So I think that, um, you know, there was that that deep inside, like, you know, I, I feel like I could be in Alaska and make this happen, you know. And so there, there's this belief that you can get it done. Um, but then as things start to roll, you know, and, and you get your your journey of your coaching career going and you see how the years start stacking on top of the years and then what defines you as a coach or a program. And um, the culture here has been really um, super cool to be a part of. Of course, I've, you know, the one that runs the program. And so you would say that, you know, I'm the head of the culture of the program, but it takes everyone. It takes a village. And I'm just so lucky to have a lot of people that really pour into this place. And then, you know, it, it pours itself back and um, very lucky on that side. So, um, so yeah, there, there's a bit here that, um, you know, had, had big belief in it. Um, but I will say that every year you look back at it, you're like, how can we be better? And then we would, we would take on that task and be better. Uh, and that's a, a player driven and a coach driven mindset. And when you talk about, uh, being better, looking specifically at this team and culture, uh, you bring in, I think six freshmen, maybe seven, mm -hmm. but I mean, five of the top 15 in the country, including uh, Ashton Danley, I think, who was ranked number two in the country by, by yeah. one of the services. Um, you know, they're they're very accomplished players already. Yeah. But they're joining a team with Kaylee Mudge and Harding yeah. and Kerr and mm -hmm. Devin Flaherty. Like, they're joining te a team of already ready-made, not ready-made, but established stars. Yeah. How do they, how would they fit in? Do you expect learning curves, even from the really talented players, not just on the field, but getting accustomed to being around other really good players that will hold them accountable? Yeah, yeah. Accountability, really tough leadership, you know, always really big challenges for um, teams in general and players, you know. So you look at Mudge or Ocho or Ed and Field, Devin Flaherty, you know, people that would have a voice because they've been in the experienced situations. Um, but then like they've grown up too. they were freshmen, they were sophomores, you know, they're in a different role now. And I'm asking them to be uh, leaders in their actions and their words. Um, well, people were leaders for them when they were younger. So they've got to figure out how to do that. Um, so it's growing for them also. So I, I feel like every year is different. 100% uh, relying on people with the experience. They know where they're going. They know what they're getting into. Danley has no idea. She's excited about it. I just saw her this morning coming out of the training room. Super excited about what's ahead of her no idea where she's going. 
next year you come back as a sophomore, you're like, oh, I, I now know why, you know, off season training is really important. You know, I now know why drinking water is really important, you know, and um, they have never lived a full 60 game season, maybe 70 game season. And so, um, so those little nuggets come in when you start to, you know, get to your returning players, but we are a different team. We're going to rely on some freshmen uh, this year. I'm really excited. They will be different. You know, those freshmen will be different February, March, April. They're going to be different as they grow along. And a lot of that's because those upperclassmen put their arms around them and say, hey, man, I know what you're feeling. I've been there and let me help you through it. Does this, do you remember, is, had there been another season quite like this where you have, like we talked about, you have some established veterans, a lot of them actually. Yes. Uh, Haley, you have you have players that have accomplished a lot and hit home runs in, in Oklahoma City. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like there's some spots there to be won. Yeah. And you have some hungry freshmen. Um, do you think, you just mentioned it, do you think this freshman class will will have to contribute quite a yeah. bit for this season? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah, definitely going to have to um, contribute. And when I say contribute, um, just being present. I, I think if I if we could do a really good job of keeping them present um, so they can learn throughout, you know, by the end of February, you know, if our head's above water and we're present and we feel the highs and lows and we feel the big TV games and we feel those pressures and we feel the Wednesday night games, we feel the um, load on a Monday and after playing four days in a row, like, you know, how to get yourself back. If you can be present, feel all that, you can really have a successful second half of the season. Um, if you get completely overwhelmed and you just can't be present for it and you don't know how to get through it. So we will, you know, definitely rely on them big, but it is our jobs as coaches and upperclassmen to make sure that we, we get them through it because they can contribute. Torres is going to be great at shortstop position. You know, Annie Potter came in as a transfer, has been there before, but new to our program and, you know, can play the middle and field. Jason E. Beecham, you know, flat out swings it. She's going to play some third. You know, you got Ocho over there, but she's helping her out. We've got kids also graduating, you know, so we've got to maintain the fact that you're going to experience for this season, but what are we getting next season too? So we got to pour into that part of it also. And then, you know, I think the pitching staff in general, we've got some returners. Um, they just haven't had tons of innings. So they know the system. They just haven't been there. And then some rookies coming in, they're going to go through it and, and figure it out. So super exciting on the coaching side. Um, we just have to manage the expectation side. There's an expectation and a standard here in the program, and we want that. And that these kids want that when they come into it. But you have to work on the execution daily and not let the expectation outweigh the being present in the moment to execute what I need to do right now. Well, and that, that's kind of what I was going to ask, Lonnie. You, you've got this program to a point where obviously you made it to the, the championship series last year. You've won national championships. You're a fixture in Oklahoma City. How do you get veterans? Like, it's one thing for freshmen, but veterans like Devin and Kaylee, both Kayleys, to keep their feet on the ground and not look to yeah. May. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the, the, you don't get to May where you want to be unless you're doing what you need to do in January and February. But they're so veteran. They've been through this before. Like, how do you keep them? You know, do you know what I'm asking? Like, oh, how yeah. do you keep them from wanting to look ahead and yeah. jump ahead <laughs> to those to those series and those games? Yeah, I think we do a really good job of um, just playing in the moment. You know, and Ellie Cooper, our player performance coach, um, who's been in their shoes before, can sit and speak uh, at a mental session game, you know, a mental game session with us and talk about like, what are you feeling right now? And, you know, we just had a session yesterday where you know, Ocha, like, what do you need to optimally perform? What do you need to be thinking? What do you need to be doing? And so sharing their experiences. And I'll tell you last season, it was, you know, week by week. It wasn't, we know, we always have a goal of being in Oklahoma City, but there is a process to get there. And our kids last year had to earn that process. So now they have respect for that process to turn around and say, it's a new team. We're earning the process to hopefully give us the opportunity to make the run. And so I think we're really grounded in that. So it's not come in, we're going to the World Series. It's come in, let's earn it, earn it daily. Let's go through this. And then if we get the chance, you know, we can make a run. So it, it's very grounded in that sense. Do you think the influx of freshmen having, I guess, seven new players on this team, seven or eight, whatever it is, like almost a third of the roster, or almost 40% of the roster helps in that regard? Yeah. Like they've never played Florida. Yeah. You know, they've never played a, a road series in the ACC like that, yeah. that they're going to be doing all this stuff for the first time, which might keep your veterans. Not that you'd have a problem with that anyway, but keep them in the moment, too, because they're going through it with their teammates. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, sometimes it's as a freshman, you don't know what's ahead of you. That's that could be just pure joy. You're just going out and playing softball game, whereas right. a returner, you know, what's ahead of you. So like you have these expectations, you know, so there is a good balance to both. Um, you know, and, and I think that goes back to us as a coaching staff, like. We'll get moments where we're like, oh, we can see they're nervous. They should be nervous. Let them enjoy this moment. 
because they have earned this nervousness, right? And then how do we handle it? So afterwards we can debrief it. So the next time we get to a stage of expectation versus execution, we have something to fall back on. It's also hard as hell to get to Oklahoma City. Like really hard. hard. Like <laughs> you guys were an awesome team last year and you kind of needed a no hitter from your yeah. star pitcher to get to Oklahoma City. Yeah. And then you were basically, I don't know, a great catch in center field away from at least being in a game three. And that's how... The, the 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 margins are so narrow yeah that it's almost like you have to enjoy there's no guarantee I mean you lived that two years ago there's yeah. no guarantee that no matter what you do during the season you're gonna get to Oklahoma City and win it so appreciate yeah. and enjoy the journey is that yeah. a is that a message you guys kind of tell them a lot yeah for sure you know I was watching the Lions Niners game the other day and it's like it's crazy how in games when you get to like the last part of your season crazy things happen you know ball off the map and the guy picks it up and runs it in right. and it's like right. It's like those things happen in all sports, you know? So sometimes you got to tip your cap and be like, man, that's a game of softball. And then there's times where like, I expect myself fundamentally to be here. And then there's times like crazy things happen, you know? And it's like, I think we appreciate all of it, you know? And it's like, if you go out there and you just try to just grind it out all the time. And it is, I don't think people realize we're playing 56 games. When you make a run at 70 games in three months, like we are going, we are going Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're going to play on a Wednesday and a Thursday and to go again, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it is the, the challenge part of it is pretty incredible in the baseball softball sport, you know? And so we don't get a lot of time to prep. You just got to rely on the fact that you can play the game. So there's things we got to high five and love up. And then there's things we just got to laugh off and that's the way it is. So we just got to keep balancing that because it is a long journey and uh, you know, you really got to enjoy that part of the journey. When you when you look at this season, obviously we just talked about, or I did about Cat. Um, that's a those are enormous shoes to fill. One of yeah. the best that's ever done it. Um, I guess talk and then Muffley at shortstop. Obviously, one of the best defensive players, it, it, probably in ACC history. I would think she was just outrageous. Yeah. Where do you look? Where do you see yourself right now as a team? Do you do you even have a defined like this is going to be our number one pitcher? This is going to be our starting shortstop. Would you even know that? in late January, early February? Um, I mean, I think we have an idea. Um, but, you know, again, like you start playing the games and they'll figure it out. So by the end of February, we're going to have a really good idea. And that's usually how we go. We get to the end of February and um, we're like, man, we really like this combination of pitching staff. We really like this combination of infielder. We like this lineup part of hitting, you know, or when we're facing a good rise ball kid, we like this lineup, you know? So we, we really try things out a lot in the fall and or in February to give us a good feeling as we jump into the ACC season. So, yeah, so have some ideas, but things will definitely hit us and, and be able to make some changes when we get to end of February. And I, I've asked you this before, but I think there's a lot of reasons that your program stands out. The way you guys play defense uh, mm -hmm. is, is pretty remarkable. I mean, you guys have been very good at that for a long time. And we hear in every sport, Coaches preach how much defense matters. They preach it, the fundamentals. That's what they're focusing on. And then you watch that team play, and you're like, do you guys even practice? Yeah. <laughs> but you, I've watched you guys practice. I know yeah. how you do it. Um, have have these newcomers, along with the veterans, fit right into what you're trying to build uh, defensively? Because I think – I might be wrong. I might be speaking out of turn. I think that's one of the backbones of your program is what you do defensively. Yeah, I think it's a the mindset is pitching and defense working together. So instead of just pitchers and defense and hitters, it's pitching and defense and then it's base running and hitting. Right. So like, how do you work together? So uh, people running on base and the hitter, you guys are one. If I have a shortstop and a pitcher, we're one. Right. So we're really making sure that we have a good idea of what I do and I'm trying to do in the circle, which is going to now. You know, Megan King got to the point where she was like throwing a pitch saying, Callie Harrod, here you go. You know, like it got so in sync, but that takes time and that takes a, a lot of opportunity. And so right now in the beginning, we might be a little like off cue because we have new pitchers that we really don't know what the situation is going to hold for them. The moment in a game, you know, feeling that like Danley's going to be a freshman in a game feeling it. And then over time, we have to figure out what Danley, Danley gives us. Right. And then she starts to get that feel of like, oh, now I know what I'm good at. Now we're going to work together, you know, peeps behind me. And so uh, I, I think that's uh, something gets earned, you know, through the month of February. And we talk about it a lot. And you mentioned Dan Lee. So I'm going to bring it back to her real quick. She's the one that was, I think, like we talked about, ranked number two in the country. Um, she's a pitcher, but she also hit. Yeah. Is she going to hit for you guys? Yeah. yeah. Have you had I, Have you had a lot of pitchers that were also hitters for you over the um, years? You know, I think it's kind of changing. I mean, Mac Leonard would have been the two-way player for us last sure. year. He came in a lot and hit and played some first base. And, 
you know, it's funny, the last couple of camps is starting to change again. All the pitchers coming in are hitting and playing positions. And so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pitchers out there that we've seen be able to do both. And we have some of the pitchers are very athletic. Cat was very athletic. She could play, um, you know, some defense. She could hit. She could swing it. She just chose to really focus on the pitching side of it. So, um, so I think that, you know, it may change a little bit as we go along here and some pitchers may hit, which is nice. It's nice to have someone to be able to bring in and out of the game or in and out of situations. But you also got to manage their load and make sure that their bodies can handle it. Um, Ashton's a pretty smooth delivery, so she's very efficient. So that allows her the ability to be able to do both. And then just I, I just don't want to fly past her because she was so awesome. Um, it's going to be the first time in, what, five years since you didn't have Kat? Yeah. <laughs> Pitching for you? Yeah. As a coach, and we just talked about this before we started, this is your 16th or 17th year. I think it's your 16th. That's what the bio said anyway, which is crazy. I can't yeah. believe it's been 16 years. Yeah. Um, this is this is a part of the job. You, you get to know these these players. You, you watch them grow up. You watch them become awesome. Yeah. And then they leave you. Yeah. Um, but what she seems to be a, one of those extra special ones that have come through this program. Yeah. Was it weird the first day of practice and her not being there? Like just I, I feel like that would have been a – like that's like a warm blanket you've had yeah. <laughs> to wrap yourself in over the last four years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you definitely get used to some players and anchoring positions. I would say Jesse Warren was one of them, you know, sure. and then um, obviously Sid Cheryl, like they just anchor their position so well, Cat for sure um, in the circle. But I also, you know, Cat was really good last year at like, you know, I, I need to make sure I communicate with McKenna and I communicate with Allison and Emma, like, you know, I'm changing, I'm handing you the ball and you got the next group and, I've done all I can for this program and I came here to, you know, go pro and do some things later. And she earned all that. So she gave us everything possible at Florida State. And then she was ready to go on and put it all to the test at another level. And so there was really good closure uh, at the end of the season last year. And so not that, you know, my heart doesn't miss her for sure, but now it's opportunities for other people to step up. So what she poured into them and what I'm pouring into them is their chance now. And Megan King did that to her. And Jessica Burroughs did that to Megan King, you know, so it's like, there's been prominent pitchers throughout here that have been like, Hey, here's the torch, you know, take care of the program. And so, um, so yes, you know, professionally, if I was a pro coach, you know, you're keeping them around forever and you're mm. doing exactly what they need to do, but you're in college and the opportunity is that four years with them and to grow them the best you can. And then the, them realize how special it's been their journey, their experience, and they're giving back because now someone else is, is taking it on. So, um, so she's been back here and, you know, we keep in touch quite a bit, um, but, you know, she was tremendous, but now she is so ready for the next level. She's pitching in Japan. She loves it. She's traveling the world. She loves it. It's it's just really cool to see. Lonnie, and I, and I wanted to ask you as we get, as we wrap this thing up, and I, and I hate this question because I feel like I've asked it to you for five years in a row about the growth of this game yeah. in the, in the popularity of your team in particular in this city, but I don't want to ever dismiss it as in, in not acknowledge that I have a pretty good feeling that if Kaylee Mudge and Harding and Michaela, in fact, I've seen Michaela walk into restaurants yeah. <laughs> and you would think she's Jordan Travis. Yeah. Like people rush up. Like, I can't imagine what that's like for you. And I'm going to phrase it and frame it. Like I have the last five times I've asked you this question <laughs> to see the popularity of this sport in the popularity of these players becoming like legitimate stars on campus and stars in the country. Um, that has to just talk about a war something that warms you. Yeah, that's just got to be really, really neat. And it keeps growing. It yeah. keeps it, it doesn't stop. It hasn't plateaued. You look at the women's basketball national championship game with Iowa and LSU. I think it outdrew the men's game yeah. or got close to it. I just feel like this is a it's been a long time coming, but it's almost like a reckoning when it comes to women's sports, especially college sports. It yeah. hasn't hit the pro sports yet, but college sports, women's college sports has never been more popular. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a little switch in um, how people play the game. So I think females in general just play for such joy and their teammates. That's just the, the culture of it, right? Um, so, and there's a societal side that likes to just watch things for the fun of it. Like people like feel good watching people smiling and having fun and big pressure moments, right? Where the male game can get so dominating and it, you know, it's, it's a, you can't smile. You can't high five things like, you know, right. sometimes, but I've also now seen a little switch. You see MLB, you know, they're in there, they're doing their uh, home run little trots yeah. in their dugouts or high five. They're trying to have fun. The whole thing in MLB is let the boys play, you know, like they're trying to find that fun, not so macho situation. Um, you know, I, I see the end zone touchdown dances and the stuff. So it's like, we're morphing a little bit into 
we want to have fun. everyone wants to have fun you're you're training at a high high level softball basketball like a lot of these girls growing up now had their moms playing in college my mom wasn't allowed to play in college so title nine's really kicking in with the opportunity like these kids are growing up on a dinner table that mom and dad both played in college and they're telling their stories. So the daughters are hearing that where before all they heard was dads talking about their stories. Right. So now we're starting to get an equal like respect. We can play at a high level. We're working at a high level, we're being trained at a high level. So the game is fun to watch and then the girls are having fun doing it, you know? And so I think the man, the men's game is starting to come a little bit more to like, it can be fun. It doesn't always have to be so, you know, me versus you and I have to grimace all the time, you know? So it's it's fun so i appreciate that side of it i think people come to the park they enjoy it they have a good time they get to know the players they feel very you know there's a lot of aunts uncles and grandmas and grandpas out here right they're just they don't, may not know the players but they know the players it, it's just a, right. it's a really connected uh sport so we take pride in that we want to have people feel good about it and they want i want them to walk away feeling the pride of being connected to our program because we play the game right we play with heart it may not be about the wins and losses, but we really enjoy watching them do their thing. And before I let you go, uh, two quick questions. First off, what was it like to watch what the soccer team did this year? You share yeah. a complex with them. Um, I'm hoping to get Brian on the show uh, at some point in the next yeah. week or two. Uh, I, I, You could make an argument. That was one of the best soccer teams in college history. I mean, it no. was ridiculous what they did. Yeah. What is that like? Just the excellence that's in that building. And and I don't, I know, I don't know if it's competitive. I'm sure it's not. You're rooting for each other, yeah. but it's kind of cool that you keep, you guys keep adding trophies next to each other. Yeah. 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 I thought for a fundraising thing, we could sell the water here, right. For a while, because there was nothing <laughs> sure. in the pipes here that someone needed and, you know, it'd be a good fundraising event, but no, we're big fans of Penske. I was a big, you know, I'm coach Gregorian was great to us. Um, we are housemates. It's crazy how much we don't mingle. We get in our mm. world and we get after it. So I asked uh, BP to come out and talk to our team the other day. And right. uh, he was spot on with a little pregame speech for a pre-practice speech for us. And, um, you know, just just feeling the situation that he got into. Um, Mark was incredible, strategic human, like a coaching. They were so strategic. Now the change of the guard, BP's a little bit more player led, uh, music's played out there. There's a different vibe, but both of them were incredible what they did for the game of soccer over there. And so, um, you know, when he spoke to our team, he is just, you know, he is about the players taking ownership and uh, getting after it. And that was just really cool to hear. You know, a lot of times coaches, we don't get to hear like their their talks. We're not in the room a lot. And so he is, he's incredible. So I hope you get him on because he's inspiring. And um, yeah, our whole team's locked in. I can't tell you. I don't know how many games our team, you know, they were all together watching their game, supporting them. They, they love watching that soccer team play. And the reason that this was my last one, the reason we didn't have him on the week after he won the national championship was because the football team got kept out of the postseason, out of the playoffs. Yeah. And I just wanted your perspective as a competitor, as an elite coach that has coached championship caliber teams and a national championship team. What was your thought w w when you saw that? Because the beauty about softball, I know there's a selection process. Yeah. But, you know, maybe the 65th team in the country doesn't make it. Yeah. But they probably had 22 losses. Yeah. A team that had zero losses. What was that like as a coach and a competitive coach that appreciates winning when maybe overcoming obstacles to win? What yeah. was that like to see uh, for yeah. one of your fellow coaches? Yeah. I mean, heartbroken. I texted Norvell right away. I think our whole team was all over social media right away because we um, we live it here. You know, the climb is not just for the football team. It's for everyone. I, I think their values and and standards of how they do things. You know, our, our players are, are with the players. Athletes are hanging around with athletes all the time, right? So they felt that. We felt that. Um, we are very family driven here in Tallahassee, you know, at Florida State. And so we, we definitely felt that part of it. We as a program are very team oriented too. And you could tell that team played for each other. So to take away that uh, part of the game and say that team doesn't matter and like right. the eye test and the skills matter, then you're taking away a huge element of what a lot of people in the country and the world cheer for is, you know, teams playing team sport. And uh, so that, that really hit home. And I know it was really tough for him, but you know, he's a great leader and he turned it around and, um, I feel like, you know, these kids will go on and, and be very, it's all experiences, right? And how we sure. respond to the experiences. And so um, they're great. That they, I'm sure they're grateful for the the journey they had. They feel snubbed at the end, but it is life and you move forward and the lessons you learned. And, and I know Norvell definitely uh, sent that message, but 
um, it all sticks in our craw a little bit. <laughs> well, he did end up taking half the Alabama team out of the portal after that happened. Yeah. So he, he, he did his work after the, after yeah. that snub. So you guys have fan day this weekend. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then the season starts, what, February 16th? Eighth. Is that right? Eighth. We're here. Um, we have, um, um, Texas Tech, which would be kind of fun. Coach Snyder, who coached with us for many years. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. Back. Yeah, and one of our former coaches, um, Bryce DeCouve, Morgan Claveman, Pedro was a manager. Morgan played here. They're all in yeah. staff. They're coming back, so it's going to be a reunion there, and Charlotte's coming in and playing fam. So it's going to be a great weekend. Um, yeah, Fan Day. It's been incredible. We started Fan Day just to, one, um, you know, get our players, especially our freshmen, a little bit of environment of the people that support them. So uh, a mingle time, a sign autographs time, play in front of everybody. So to, it's a really good time to celebrate the opening season uh, of softball. So we've tried to figure out fan day of how to educate, you know, the things that we're doing on the field and when to cheer and when to create a, a home environment. Right. And um, I know a lot of people have complimented our fans on how crazy this place is. And I think that's because they, they continue to come and be a part of growing and raising our seasons and our games. So, so fan day will be fun. It's just a, you know, an hour and 45 minute scrimmage. And then we head over to our first pitch party. And that's part of a one kicking off the season two fundraising. Cause everyone's got to do that. So it's fan raising fundraising, you know, however we want to put it, right, but uh, right. a big auction um, last year, a lot of cool stuff that we had from the world series sign. So all, you know, authentic pieces. So it, it's a really fun time for us. Lottie, you're the best. You know that. You know how much I care for you in this program. It's really fun to watch how good you guys are every year. It's just a constant. It's a constant in all our lives mm. that FSU softball is good. I know. No pressure, though. I know, right? That <laughs> no expectation pressure. execution. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but thank you very much, and we will catch up later down the road. Sounds amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Lottie.